Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecci Galanos. I am the Executive Manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. It is really with great pleasure that I am hosting this educational activity today on developing stroke care services in West Africa with exceptional speakers sharing their personal expertise on the topic through the Wessex Ghana Stroke Partnership. Now, before we start, uh, as per usual, a few of our uh, housekeeping rules. Um, we, of course, welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. Um, you can use the chat box to say hi or leave any comments that uh, you might want to leave. The webinar is recorded and the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar and it will also be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy so you can uh, watch it later. And lastly, I kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey at the end, uh, which will pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar to share any feedback that you have uh, with us. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderators, Dr. Lucy Sykes, FRCP UK Geriatric Medicine, Consultant Stroke Physician at Hampshire Hospital NHS Foundation Trust UK, and Dr. Albert Akpalu, Senior Lecturer at the School of Medicine and Dentistry, University of Ghana, and Head of Neurology and Neurophysiology, KBTH. Lucy, Albert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, Lucy, thank you. So we, 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 we have a big task today just to share the experience we've had over the last 10 years. And I must say this partnership has been a great partnership for, for us to improve our, the quality of stroke care. So this project was done with the Wessex Stroke Ghana Partnership, Kolebu Teaching Hospital, and sponsored by TET. And um, if you have time, everybody should go to our website, www.wgstroke.org. Next slide, please. So what was the partnership? Basically, I believe that exchanges of skills and experience are an important resource in supporting improvements in healthcare services and systems, especially in lower middle income countries, and also trying to bring the personal and professional benefits to health workers. Now, most partnerships have been at top level. So somebody from the UK or somewhere comes to impose their skills on a lower middle income country, which may, may not work, but this was a unique partnership and it enhanced a lot of solidarity between these countries. Next slide. So the, the partnership really encompassed the development of clinical stroke care and supporting the development of stroke services. These two are different things and to bring the concept of multidisciplinary education and care and training to stroke care. So I think that is a big part of our care, which is missing. Everybody works in silos, but MDT care, MDT education is the way to go across the sub-region and across the world. Next slide. So the vision and mission of our unit was ready to provide high quality health care to patients and our respect integrity, service, leadership, and multidisciplinary working. So the, each of the words is very loaded and speaks for itself. Service and leadership and MDT working. Next slide. So we looked at certain statements. We couldn't do at the time, when we started in 2014, we couldn't do thrombolysis. We are doing that now, but we looked at basic things, which will be talked on later. So I'm not believer that, but um, we looked at simple things that we, we could do. So that's what everybody must do. Don't think you are going to start from thrombolysis. Look at simple things. What are we doing? What are you not doing right? For example, discharge planning, we don't do that very well. We don't do communication well. We don't do positioning well. We don't do stroke presumption well. And we have poor leaders in our organization. So we looked at these ones and tried to improve on them. Next slide. So we produced this uh, excellent video the help of the Wessex team. So they are on the website on various core skills, which you can learn easily. So these are practical, easy to do things. So let's look at that. And then next slide. So what do you do on a stroke unit care? You need political will. 
If it's not in the departmental plan or vision, forget it, it will not work. You need to have a case for shared stroke care. We are not many neurologists. We have about seven neurologists, eight neurologists in Ghana of a population of um, 31 plus million people. We are not enough. So we need strokeologists. So after this seminar, you're all strokeologists. So we can go and into the field and we need equipment, we need proper beds, we need hoists, we need sheets. How do you run a unit? You need the criteria for admission. How many beds? Five, 10? What staffing levels do you need to do? What protocols do we need? We need to do MDT ward rounds and meetings. Next slide. You need cost. It's not cheap. You need a revolving fund. You need your insurance. You need to motivate your staff equipment to break down. How do you repair it? How do we do patient and care education? How do we plan our discharge pathway? So there are several points that have to come into play to make a, a successful stroke unit within our own context. So these are key challenges I think we faced and it be faced by lots of you listening to us. Next slide. So how do we do an MDT? So every field, doctors, nurses, physio, dietitian, OT, speech and language therapy, psychology, social work, everybody has to meet together. You need to communicate. You need to have respect for other specialist skills. It took me a long time as a doctor to accept this fact that I cannot alone discharge a patient. And that's a, a, a great skill. It takes a lot of the burden off us. You need to work as a team and everybody in the team needs leadership skills. Next slide. So th th this is a picture when we started first, we become more advanced about this IMDT with everybody working. So I hand over to Lucy Sykes, who has been with us since we started 10 years ago, and we are, we are happy to be back on this platform. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Albert, for that introduction. So we're now going to hear from some of the other members of the partnership, and we're going to start with an overview of um, how it all came about from Louise. Perfect. Thank you, Lucy. So hopefully you can you can see my screen. Yes. Um, great. Thank you. So my name is Louise Johnson. I, I'm a physiotherapist and I've been involved in the Wessex Ghana Stroke Partnership since its inception. Um, and I'm just going to give over the next 10 to 15-ish minutes a bit of an overview of the work of the partnership and some of the background uh, to how we came about building on, on what um, Albert has told us already. Um, but just to start, I think it's worth us recapping on why stroke is such an important global problem. And I know lots of this will be familiar to people on the webinar today. But stroke remains the second leading cause of death in the world, and over 12 million new strokes happen each year, um, and an estimated 101 million people are living with some form of disability following a stroke. Um, and this burden of stroke in terms of the absolute number of cases is increasing, so it's something that's on the rise. And whilst lots of people might associate stroke with Western societies, it's actually the fourth leading cause of death in low-income countries. Um, and when we started this partnership together back in 2009, stroke was reported as the leading cause of death at Kualebu Teaching Hospital in Accra, where, where our partnership is based. So it's a significant problem. Um, and the impacts of stroke um, and the burden of stroke is significant and, and wide and wide reaching. It impacts individuals, obviously, and families, but also communities and health systems. Um, and we also know that there's a huge disparity in, in outcomes for people who have stroke, who, sorry, for people who experience a stroke across the world, as there is for many aspects of healthcare. Um, but a disproportionate amount of the global burden of stroke in terms of both death and disability sits in low and middle income countries. Um, and this data here is from a really recent report, which estimates that 89% um, of stroke, death and disability um, reside in low and middle income countries. So who, who are we as a group? So when Wessex Ghana Stroke Partnership was first established back in 2009, we weren't aware of very many international health partnerships that focused on non-communicable disease. Um, we're now aware that there are many, many more. We are a group of health professionals from the UK and Ghana who have a shared interest in improving the delivery of stroke care in our home nations and more globally. Um, from a UK perspective, we work across multiple organisations, so we are not a team who work together on a day-to-day -day basis, 
um, but we come from a number of organisations across um, our region in the south of the UK. And in Ghana, the team are based predominantly at Kuala Lumpur Teaching Hospital in Accra. And as Albert has um, alluded, our partnership is built on strong values of mutual respect. We've worked together really hard to build a responsible health partnership and a sustainable health partnership. And we really do recognise the reciprocal benefits that that brings to, to both partners. And all partnerships are about collaboration. And I think it's really useful just to recognise that and the roles that different uh, partners bring to the table. So as a UK team, we predominantly work in the speciality of stroke care. So we are able to bring some experience and expertise from working within organised stroke services and fairly well-developed stroke services in the UK. And we've got experience of working as an MDT um, and knowledge of the benefits that that brings. And we bring some skills in quality improvement and in mentorship. But none of that would be of any use without the expertise that the Ghanaian team bring. And they very much led the direction of this partnership by bringing and sharing their vision for stroke care at Kole Bu and beyond. Uh, they bring vital knowledge relating to local culture and context, as well as experience of affecting change within their organisations of knowing who to influence and how to influence stakeholders. Um, and these are just some of the differences in, in what each partner brings, and they are all of equal importance to the success of the partnership. Um, and we really recognise the biggest benefits come when these different aspects are recognised and are appreciated and are brought together. So this is a very brief timeline of our partnership outlining three really key phases of work. So the early work of our partnership, um, which was supported by a grant between uh, 2012 and 14, focused on the development of core clinical skills uh, with the aim of improving basic standards of care for stroke, for people with stroke. Um, and following on from this, we began to expand the range of clinical skills training, but also built in some focus training and support in both quality improvement and leadership in order to spread knowledge and knowledge translation at Kole Bu. And finally, our most recent grant, which ended in uh, 2018, so a few years ago now, sought to increase uh, stroke care capacity within Ghana by beginning to disseminate that training to two other hospitals. And that dissemination work was led by the Ghanaian team um, with some arm's length support from us as a UK partner. And these are just some photos that show some of the steps in our journey. So this is 2009, right at the very beginning of the partnership. And at this time, stroke wasn't really recognised as a speciality um, at Kuala Bu. There was no coordinated multidisciplinary care, which are things that we know from the evidence base form the cornerstone of good stroke care and make a difference, a real difference to patient outcomes. Uh, and this picture shows two ladies with stroke who are on a medical ward at that time, and they were managed uh, like this, lying, lying in bed until their families were able to take them home. And this is 2012, a few, few years later, at the beginning of our first main phase of work. And one of the things that we did quite early on was identify stroke care leads for each profession um, and deputy leads and supported them to train staff um, at that point in time on the medical wards in four basic core skill areas. And we chose those skill areas together um, thinking about the things that would benefit the majority of patients and that could be implemented with little resource, but um, improve patient care and clinical outcomes. And we'll come on a bit more to those, uh, what those things were later. And we recognise in really that getting the basics right and delivering the basics consistently is what's really important at this stage and the partnership move from here. So just moving on, I'm going to talk really briefly through four areas that we feel have been really key enablers of stroke care development in Ghana. Um, and the first is that the, the partnership led to the opening of the first stroke unit in West Africa and the unit opened in 2014. Um, it wasn't our initial intention to necessarily work towards uh, a stroke unit and we knew that we could begin to improve care without that. But actually having a dedicated protected stroke unit space without doubt has been a significant enabler in the development of uh, stroke care. And these are some photos from 2014, the year the stroke unit opened, showing the Ghanaian team putting some of their new clinical and teaching skills into practice on that new unit. And these figures are from the end of our kind of more formal partnership work. They will be higher now, actually. But at that time, um, over 1,500 patients had benefited from care on the stroke unit at Kuala Bu. 
Um, 27 staff from a whole range of professions had been assessed as competent in core stroke skills that were relevant to their role and had demonstrated that they're able to put those skills into practice. And 97% of patients who were coming through the unit were achieving high quality care benchmarks. So those benchmarks represent the, eight, the eight key clinical areas that we worked on together. And agreeing benchmarks and monitoring their achievement through local audit is one of the ways that we've been able to really understand the, the clinical care delivered to patients and to monitor that and to drive that up. So the second enabler, which we've talked about already and we'll keep coming back to is, multi, is the multidisciplinary nature of the partnership and the recognition that that has gained, not just on the stroke unit at Corley Blue, but actually beyond the stroke unit, there is a real recognition that uh, working in a more multidisciplinary way is, can only be a, a positive thing for patient care. So we've had a strong focus on MBT working since the very beginning of the partnership. Uh, the, the UK team and the Ghanaian team are both multidisciplinary in nature. Um, but at the time, that was a fairly new concept to, to colleagues in Ghana who were more used to working within their own kind of professional silos. And this slide is just showing some examples of, uh, of the team working together, of different professions contributing to stroke care. And there are lots of examples of how they've worked together to, to share and set their vision, um, how we've collaborated across professions to develop and deliver training, um, including the sharing of skills across professions. Um, and how data has been collected and used to, to inform improvements has all happened in a, a multi-professional way. Uh, and these pictures from 2016 show the unit. It is amazing. People do not lie flat in bed like those photos from 2009. The care they receive is coordinated. It's delivered from a skilled team um, who include um, all of the professions who are kind of core to stroke unit care delivery. And those things wouldn't have happened in 2009. So the next thing is, is, as we've said, focusing on core clinical skills. So really key to the partnership has been thinking about the low cost core things that are the building blocks for good stroke care. Um, and together we've built a robust system for training to be disseminated. So using a train the trainer model, always thinking about succession planning um, and really sharing skills and help, helping people to, to develop in, within their professions as experts. And throughout the partnership, a large number of healthcare staff from a range of different backgrounds have access to training relating to stroke care. Uh, that's ranged from workshops, which are more around raising awareness to more in-depth clinically based training, which is evidenced through the use of competencies. So through the partnership work itself, more than a thousand uh, staff have been trained. Um, and this will be higher now if we add in the ongoing training that the Ghanaian team are, are delivering independently um, of the partnership in recent years. Uh, we had 20 visits to Ghana over the years from UK health professionals and also three visits to the UK by members of the Ghanaian team. Um, and I'll, I'll skip over this one because Albert's already mentioned the training videos which are on the website and are really worth a, a look if you're interested to see. They've been accessed in um, a lot of countries and they've had I think more than a thousand hits to date. So finally, um, the work of our partnership has not focused solely on clinical skills. And we also feel this is one of the really key uh, enablers of the success of the work that we've done together. So in any healthcare environment, including in the UK where I work, training of staff does not necessarily translate into changes in clinical practice. Putting skills into routine care requires much more than just building knowledge within staff. It requires a, a culture change. It requires the system and the processes to be right to enable those skills to be used. So whilst the clinical skills themselves are clearly very important, we've used a leadership and a quality improvement approach as a framework for that clinical skill development, which um, has happened in lots of different ways. It's included reflective sessions, one-to-one uh, -one mentorship, sharing knowledge around quality improvement and quality improvement tools and leadership theory, all of which has been adapted to, to appreciate local culture and context. But this approach has built capacity within the Ghanaian team to not only continue to grow their own service at Kulebu, but also to start to share and spread that um, within Ghana and beyond. And we're going to hear more about um, that in session three today. So these are our, our kind of our four kind of core take home messages, I guess, of the things that we feel 
together have really helped the development of stroke care in Ghana. And we're going to pick up a little bit more on the cl clinical skills and on the leadership aspects of the partnership. So I'm just going to bring my screen down. Um, and then we're going to show you a pre-recorded uh, video focusing on the clinical skill development. Hello and welcome to this part of the webinar that's going to discuss how we developed the clinical skills with the nursing team at Corley Boo Hospital. Um, firstly, I'd just like to go around and introduce everyone who's on this part of the webinar. So my name's Claire Gordon. I'm the stroke consultant nurse at Lanx Teaching Hospital and also a senior research fellow at the University of Central Lancashire. Next is Dorothy. Yeah, hello. I'm Dorothy Anani, stroke lead, Corley Boo Teaching Hospital, Accra, Ghana. And next is Josephine. And, and I'm Josephine Anua at a stroke lead, stroke unit, Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Accra, Ghana. Thank you. I'm Monica Akia, stroke lead, Kolibu Teaching Hospital, stroke unit, Accra, Ghana. And finally, the other Claire. Hi, I'm Claire, and I'm a former consultant nurse from the Royal United Hospital in Bath. And now I'm a senior lecturer in advanced clinical practice at the University of the West of England. Thank you. So firstly, Dorothy, I'm wondering whether you could just um, talk to us through the um, what the, the clinical skills training comprised of. Thank you very much. The clinical core skills comprise of wallowing, positioning, continence, communication, functional independence, mood, secondary prevention, and discharge plan. Thank you. Lovely. And Dorothy, at the, um, at the, we were, you and I were present at the beginning of the partnership when um, all the stroke patients admitted to Corley Boo were um, in, in any of the medical wards in the hospital. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about how we first started the skills training with the nursing teams that could be on any of those medical wards. So firstly, how did we decide on the core skills? Thank you very much. We decided, we, we agreed together as a team to uh, talk about these various presentation because most of the stroke patients present with these signs and symptoms. And we, we also felt it was, we will be confident uh, in managing our patients if we are trained in these areas. Thank you. And how did you go about implementing the training? We implemented the training by identifying leads and deputy leads, and also train, we use the train, the trainer model and flip charts. We also have a great knowledge questionnaires were also administered to staff to assess their knowledge level before the training. And we also have logbooks, which has uh, knowledge aspects of the skills. And then the skill aspects where the, uh, after we have given the knowledge, we go clinically to the patient bedside to assess the knowledge that they, they have acquired, whether they have been able to uh, grasp it. We also provided logbooks where we used to assess them uh, as often as possible, both the UK team and then the Ghanaian team. I was, I remember my time, I was assessed by Claire Fubuk. And I had to set a tray to do swallowing where she assessed me and logged me. We did that to all the team members. And then it, uh, we had the UK team uh, role modeling, they role model as, uh, as a team. And also we were assigned to mentors. So Claire Fubuk was my mentor which really helped, which we have also continued so this time. Thank you. So Claire, I'm going to hand over to you now. Great, thank you. Um, Monica, um, I just wondered how the skills and training are being delivered now. We've, not, we've obviously not come to uh, the unit for a couple of years. How is it all going? Yes, so currently we are following the same um, protocol so we identify leads and mentors. So whenever we get students, new staff on the units, we actually do pre-tests to assess their knowledge level 
before we start the training. We we use the skills uh, competency skills slides. This is what we use for the presentation for the training. So that is what we are using currently. So we have the swallow, we have communication, we have continence, we have positioning. So that is what we are using to do the training, the competency skills slides. We also organize practical sections to so ensure that they are practically oriented. So they have to know how to do proper positioning of patients. They have to know how to do swallow assessments. They have to be able to know how to assess communication of a client, when to do bladder training for a patient. So we go through all these practical sections with them. We also um, organize, we use the train logbooks. Sorry, we use the train logbooks to also assess their knowledge and then the skills after we have given them the training. Yes, we also give them the opportunity, the trainees, we give them the opportunity to do presentation on the competency skills to see how well they can train others after they've been trained. Yes. We also organize post-training post tests for them to know what they have acquired after the training. We do our continuous MDT meetings and then we do our discussions still around the competency skills and then the core skills as we go about our daily MDT meetings on the world. So the training is actually ongoing, it's continuous, but we go through all these protocols for our staffs whenever we get new staffs in the unit. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. So it sounds like it's really embedded into your normal routine for, for new staff coming to the unit. Yes, yes, yes. So we have identified leads and then we assign them to mentors. So the old staff who were trained by the UK team have become mentors. So we assign the new staff to them to mentor them in their competency skills. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. It sounds really positive. Um, Josephine, a couple of years ago, um, some members from the Ghanaian team um, came to the UK and spent some time clinically in Bournemouth Hospital and in the Royal United Hospital in Bath. I just wondered, um, were there any improvements? Did you see any clinical improvements on the stroke unit when they returned? And if there were any improvements, can you explain in what way, please? Yes, it did. It, it really helped to well establish our MDT team. We were able to collaborate more and it complemented our work and we were able to bring other um, professionals together. Because when we started, we started with the medical team, the nursing team, the physio, but we brought the OTs, the pharmacists, the speech therapists, et cetera, because it was there. It was in UK that the team had opportunity to experience home assessments, you know? So all these things, they brought it on board and it helped to strengthen our MDT team and discussions, sharing ideas in the management of our stroke patients. So it really helped a lot. Then again, it boosted the confidence of the leads who had the opportunity to travel. Mm -hmm. You know, they also had to train other staff. So they were able to know what they have to teach and effectively teach because they observe a lot of things and then they learned a lot of things. So it boosted their confidence a lot. And then it also established the link we had with the UK Wessex team by sharing ideas to empower us to do more in, in our patients' management. Yes. Fantastic. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, and Josephine, finally, in a previous discussion, you had mentioned the benefits of the Wessex Ghana Stroke Partnership. And I wondered if you could elaborate on these, please, for the end of this section. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, to us, the staff, it's really improved our knowledge and skills and attitude, and it made us confident because we were trained by leads. And we also had to train other people. So you need to learn more, broaden your knowledge to be able to deliver. So it really boosted our confidence. And as at now, I can stand in front of magnitude of people and give a lecture on their <laughs> competence skills. And I'm really confident. So yes, I'm happy about that. And then we were also satisfied with the care we gave to our patient. They were really quality because you always have at the back of your mind the competence skills and you always make sure that or make sure that you did the right things or do the right things. So yes, that really helped us. 
to the patients we saw most of our patients being discharged home i mean recovery we had a lot of recovery rates we reduced complication etc example is um, you know you we always have to do our swallowing assessments you know to prevent patient from getting aspiration so those complications were reduced etc and then to the institution most people want to bring their stroke patients to qualification hospital stroke units because they know that when they bring their patients here they are competent staff to help in the management of the patients and then even sometimes on tv radios we hear our names people praising us for what we are doing you know that they brought the patient to the stroke unit and they like the care that was delivered the team was professional etc and then um, even to the hospital that let me say brought more revenue to them because people who were coming in and they had to deal with etc so yes these are some of the benefits it's had on the staff the patient and then the hospital and even the patient relative because we include them in the management of our patients so that when the patient is discharged home they will help with the care and the patient's recovery yes yeah, so we've done well very well <laughs> you have you have indeed <laughs> and we've certainly enjoyed being part of that journey so thank you so much yes thank you too thank you too for your support and all the equipment you brought to the units to help our patient and to help us manage our patients effectively. And then uh, you can always invite us to also deliver these our teachings to other people elsewhere in various countries. We are always ready. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. Oh, so we've had a fantastic summary from our, our nursing team about some of the clinical skills training uh, that's been delivered through the Wessex Ghana Stroke Partnership. And we're now going to hear another pre-recorded session about our leadership development uh, programme that we've run. Um, this uh, pre-recorded session also has subtitles. Some of the sound quality is a little bit off, so please bear with it, but hopefully you will uh, get most of it. So here's the next session joining me today. So we're going to have um, a conversation about the partnership and also your leadership journey as part of the Wessex Ghana Stroke Partnership. So to start off, would you like to introduce yourself um, and your role within um, Kule Boo and also the Stroke Partnership? Okay, so um, my name is Cynthia Oseyeboa. Um, I'm the lead physiotherapist for the stroke unit. Um, I've been part of the stroke unit since its inception. Um, currently, um, I mentor new and rotating physiotherapists who pass through the unit, um, as well as um, then um, I'm also the lead or the research um committee head for my department thank you and thinking about your role and how you've developed so you were identified as um being a stroke lead uh, for physiotherapy quite early in the partnership weren't you do you want to talk us through a little bit about that and how you felt when you were identified um as being a stroke lead with him um, approach from Dr. Albert Akbal, yes. And at that time, Cynthia, you were quite a junior physiotherapist, yes, right? Yes, 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 yes. I had just <laughs> completed uh, my internship. Um, I did a one-year internship after graduating, yes, I did. I had just finished my internship and just um, got in an employment with Polybu, yes. So I was very green. <laughs> so Dr. Akpalu kind of talked to you about his vision and then yes. your leadership journey has, has been, you know, as you've developed as a physiotherapist and as a stroke lead. Yes. Uh, so what impact, um, you know, how has your role developed um, as the stroke unit has also developed? What has been 
what's been the change in your role and and what have been the opportunities through the partnership and and what have you learned on your leadership journey okay so um i must say that i learned a lot from dr palu's um, leadership and then fortunately for me um other physios who were on board from the Wessex, um, I remember um, what has been very memorable. Um, when the Wessex team come around, um, aside the clinical work, we sit down and then come up with our own vision and then mission for the unit. And then there were a number of lectures on team building. Um, who a leader is, um, what are some of the qualities of a good leader, um, team building a team um, how do we get teams to work together and um, so those were very insightful and very mm -hmm. and then we also spoke about the importance of effective communication um, I learned that um, as a team leader it's important that um, I don't hide information from my team members it's important that I open up um let them know whatever is happening um so that they'll be able to buy also into the vision it's how important it is um to plan um succession yes to ensure the sustainability of the um <laughs> stroke um care yes Definitely. and to have new leaders coming through that will take over in the future yes. yeah through about your own learning and development as part of the partnership and also becoming a stroke lead as at the time dr palu shared his vision with me i was a junior physiotherapist um by coming on board the partnership um i learned so much from the Wessex team and then from the Ghanaian team as well. Um, it's boosted my confidence um, to, it's, I learned a lot of presentation skills from and then from the Wessex team. Um, but, um i would forever be grateful to emily and um, we did a lot of hands-on yes and then with louise johnson as well there was a lot of um hands-on there was a lot of handling skills they're so working with, with patients uh, together she would listen to you she would teach you um she would just pick the scan the mri and then explain it to you every detail yes she really challenged me <laughs> so it she sounds did. like there's a mix there there's a bit about role modeling both um yeah. you know for yourself and also seeing others as role models there's something about that joint working together um and discussing cases and learning from each other so both the uk team learning from the Ghanaian team and the Ghanaian team learning from us as a UK team. And then at a point, as part of the partnership, um, we were asked to choose um, our mentors. I've forgotten the exact word I was used, yes. So, so I was supposed to liaise with her and then through emails, through um, whichever means to communicate and then continuously ensure that the flow of knowledge or knowledge sharing continued. Yes, that was a very good also part of the um, aspect of the partnership. And did that help, Cynthia, when we weren't over on visits or you weren't over visiting the UK, did that help to keep the continuity of the partnership? Yes, 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 yes. When, when we came over um, to the UK, even though it was a very short visit, um, I had a chance to visit Portsmouth and then Bournemouth. Yes, it was an eye-opener for me. It was very, also very insightful. Um, 
as at that time, I had not seen a multidisciplinary, an effective multidisciplinary team working. But when I came over, I was able to experience it firsthand, how it worked. So can I ask you, Cynthia, how would you sum up the benefits of the Wessex Ghana Strait Partnership? What have been the benefits to yourself as an individual, but also um, the wider team, patients as well? Um, myself, it has really helped me a great deal um, in terms of my career development. And okay, so I was talking about my personal development. And I mentioned that it helped boosted my confidence. Um, I learned a lot of leadership skills. Um, I gained a lot of clinical skills from the hands on work. Um, Emily, Amelia, Louise Johnson, and even the occupational therapists who came on board. And I learned a lot of key uh, team working skills sharing it also with students with junior physios who come there and then even with other members of the healthcare team and even personally um i just took on um an msc program in leadership a clinical leadership and then management um i just completed and graduated early January, yes. Brilliant. <laughs> so there were first two. <laughs> and um, personally, I look up to look a lot of And then there was another lady, um, as at the time she came, she was doing her PhD. Um, they have motivated me a lot. Um, I'm striving hard to also get my PhD. <laughs> Fabulous. So it's, been quite, it's been quite aspirational in terms of where you yes. want to get to and what you want to yes. do in terms of personal and professional development, but also development of the unit. Yes. And then um, I must also say that um, I have also been involved in a number of researches. This one was with um, Prof. Maria Stokes from the University of Southampton. Um, she managed to get a grant to get us the myotone device um, and so we started with a feasibility study and then from literature when it comes to africa we are the first um, to have carried out um, that research and um, had it not been covered we would have been going on with the second or even the third phase of it but we are not giving up yet um, COVID would <laughs> die down and then we can continue with it. So that has been one of the highest um, points um, for me as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to go to other hospitals. Um, we're working with the Ridge Hospital, La General Hospital, to also help them develop um, their stroke unit. Um, latter part of last year, we had a team from Sierra Leone. Um, we had a team from St. Dominic Hospital, which is in Ghana here. And so um, we continue to spread the word, the good news on stroke. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, the, so the partnership yeah, yeah. is spread beyond. Yes. in terms of teaching yes. other teams, hospitals, other countries. Yes. And, yeah. um, for, for, for the patients and their caregivers, once a relative has had a stroke, what comes to mind all over a stroke unit? Get to stroke unit, get to stroke unit. And then we did... Um, a number of education on radio, on social media. And so um, the awareness has been created. Once a patient ends up in Kolebu, all they think about is they want to come to stroke units because they have heard testimonies from other people. Um, 
how effectively the stroke team manages um, stroke patients. And yes. public health messages that yes. you've shared. Yes. Yes. Lovely. Is there anything else you would like to say, Cynthia, to sum up the partnership or, or your experience? Um, I, the partnership is one of the best things that has happened to me. I continue to um, spread and then mentor other young physios. So this is a lifelong thing. Even if I'm out of the system, even when I have left um, a legacy, and it wouldn't have been possible if I had not been part of the Western Stroke Partnership. And I'm very glad I'm making impact. The comments that I get from people, um, from relatives, from the stroke patients themselves have been overwhelming and it's been encouraging, yes. Super. Oh, well, that was a truly inspirational summary of some of the benefits of the leadership development program that we've run alongside the clinical skills training uh, between the UK and the Wessex in the UK Wessex and the Ghana team in Accra. Um, I'm sorry about the sound quality. It's the uh, reality of transcontinental working uh, and the reality of working in the in the digital age. But hopefully, uh, people were able to follow with the subtitles. So I'm now going to hand over to one of my Ghana consultant colleagues, Kodo Nkroma, who's going to just summarise um, what we've heard and a little bit about what the partnership means to him. Oh, Kojo, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Hello? Yes, okay. we can hear you Hello. now, yes. Okay, so good afternoon, yeah, good evening to all of you. So, sorry, to talk about what the WESEX uh, Kolebu Teaching Hospital Stroke Partnership uh, means to, to me, I will say that I was the stroke lead for the doctors and Lucy uh, was my mentor in the program. Uh, I started off very early when Dr. Fali uh, brought me in as a resident, a very junior resident. And through the time and the period, I'm currently the head of the stroke unit of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. That is after Dr. Fali has left uh, to become the neurology head. So basically, the partnership has changed stroke management in the country, uh, as you put it in summary. And I think one of the biggest lessons that I have gotten from that is the fact that it didn't take a lot of uh, reshaping, a lot of expensive gadgets. It went into the core of the clinical uh, method, as you say whereby the simple things, uh, the small things that we tend to overlook uh, was re-emphasized. And as the first uh, speaker alluded to, there was a culture change. And I think it's very important because uh, we said it, it's been said over again, uh, the training necessarily will not or may not translate into the result, but a culture change. And, that is one of the key things that I think the partnership had brought in. And that is what has led to the success of what we have today. Uh, if you come into the hospital now and you step into the stroke unit, uh, the culture in the unit is, still, is quite different from the rest of the hospital. Uh, the way you know, patients are handled, the way uh, assessments are done, uh, the timeliness, uh, recording the documentation, is, is, is different. So uh, it now 
part of the world where of obviously of course we have a bigger challenge with resources and all of that this partnership has gone to show us that within the context of what we have which we can still make a big difference to our patient because ultimately the patients are the beneficiaries and of course this is very evident in the recommendations that come in over and over and as Cynthia said everybody wants to come to the stroke unit and of course that becomes a challenge so now for us, the point is to also be able to plant this service across the country so that wherever patients are, they can benefit from it. Uh, so in, in summary, uh, that is the, the part I would like to put on that, uh, of course, we've all been through a big journey. It's changed us for, 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 for the better and permanently. And ultimately our patients, uh, other beneficiaries. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you, Kojo. And I'd like to say on a personal level, it has been an absolute honour and a pleasure to be part of the partnership. Uh, I think um, I can say truthfully that um, all of us in the UK have also benefited greatly from being part of it. Um, we don't have time to go into everything that all the benefits to everybody individually, but it's, it's not just a one way street, I think. It really, it's brought a lot of benefit back to our NHS organisations as well. Um, and for myself, I can say that I've not only learned clinical leadership, quality improvement skills, but I've also gained a huge network of, of friends and colleagues uh, through the partnership in Ghana and, and more widely as well. So we now come to the part of the webinar where we can answer some of the questions from our audience and I can see in the Q&A box that there are a few questions that have come in. So the first question, um, how frequently does the stroke multidisciplinary team meet? Um, I can see Josephine is on the webinar. Josephine, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, hi to everyone. Um, we meet like um, once in a week, but if there are other issues that we had to discuss, we meet more than once in a week. So we make sure that we communicate to the team members so that we all make ourselves available and then we meet and discuss issues that are pressing and we find solutions to them. So that's that's, that's really fantastic. And do you find it easy to speak up in those meetings? Does everybody have a voice? Yes, everybody has a voice. You know, you need to bring out issues and we all discuss. So everyone is given the time to talk about any pressing issues and we all discuss. So it's not just the nursing team or the medical team. We give opportunity to all the team members. So that's what we do basically. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Josephine. Can, can, can I, can I add something to that, Lucy? So yes. I think the other thing that is different is that on, on unlike the general hospital, you have to write a referral to the um, you have to write a referral to the physiotherapist, write a referral to the occupational therapist. This is a it's a seamless thing. Once you get onto the ward, that patient belongs to everyone. Physio knows when to come in, OT knows when to come in, dietitian knows SLT comes, that's the swallow and it, it, it's, it's a seamless thing. So I think that culture has worked and MDT is the way to go. A lot of people are saying, how do you sustain such a partnership? We've done, we started 2014, I've, I've come and gone. Yeah, we've got, it's, it's sustainability. That's the word that I want to use. So we have different levels of teams. This year, the first medical officers who you met at the stroke unit are going to come important so we we are getting yes so we have two modules so dr fifi um dodo and dr body are are neurology consultants so hey so we are we are replicating ourselves so we have about five six more before so let's do that let's not keep the knowledge to ourselves let us share empower others and it's a great joy for me to see um cynthia could not talk cynthia give me permission cynthia was very quiet and could not talk now she's she, she takes over the, the discussions and I have to keep quiet. So that, 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 that is a very good, that, that's a very good job for me, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's another question here for the nursing team. I can see, Josephine, is that, is that Monica with you? 
Yeah, yeah, it's Monica. Yeah. Fantastic. Monica, perhaps you could answer. Um, how long does it take um, to train a nurse in, in the skills, for example, swallowing? How long would it take to train up one of the nurses? Well, usually, just um, less than in an hour, we can train a nurse to do a swallow assessment for a patient. And then subsequently, the nurse will also practice what we have taught her to do. Yeah. So less than an hour, a nurse is able to learn how to do swallow assessment and then to practice it on the ward. So there's an initial training and assessment phase, but then there's a, an observation phase, isn't there, to make sure that it continues to be done correctly? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. So there's an observation phase. We allow you to observe, and then subsequently we give you the opportunity to also practice what you have observed and see whether you can be able to assess the swallow of a patient. And do you find that some of the clinical skills are more easily adopted or that some of them are more of a challenge? Well, it is not really a challenge. We are able to take our time to go through the core skills with them. So it can take weeks. We go through the core skills with them gradually before we take them to the practicing field. So after we have gone through the theory for about two weeks, now we come to the world to come and do practically what we have gone through during the training section. Okay, thank you. Um, Lucy, can I add something? Mm -hmm. So I think the core thing about training is you have to retrain and retrain. And every member of the team, every member of the team is tasked to make sure that the other member of the team knows what is or hasn't lost his skill. So if I see my nurses not telling the patients well, have, we have a way of bringing them to, for it's part of the leadership and the mentoring skills that, no, this person is not pulling his weight. No, I'm not doing this properly. Or even as a doctor, we are not monitoring our complications. There's something we're missing. So it is retraining, encouraging, pushing, building teamwork, building together as a team. And yes, yeah, Joseph said it takes an hour, but you can lose that skill. So it's retraining and retraining and retraining. So if you don't use it, you lose it. So we need to keep training. There's a question, oh, there's a couple of questions about um, COVID-19 and um, whether that has affected um, the ability and the experience of managing stroke patients at Kualebu and also whether it's affected the partnership. Um, Kojo, do you have um, any thoughts? Yes. Oh, yeah, so COVID Albert. affected our, sorry, COVID affected our operations. Everybody is a major teaching hospital, so people were reluctant to come to hospital. Um, people were reluctant to come to hospital. Some of the staff had COVID. I had COVID, yes, I've been vaccinated. So we were, so now we have, we screen the patients who come in for, for COVID, so we know what to do and what precautions to do. And of course, we've had COVID related strokes as well. So Yes, COVID does cause strokes. There are some of the complications of, of strokes. So yes, COVID is, is everywhere, but hey, we have to move on and follow the UK. Treat COVID like any, any other disease, but don't party. Yeah, and Kojo, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Hello, Lucy. Hey. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, to answer to that, uh, you know, with COVID also brought with it the ability to still be able to communicate and get things across, you know, without necessarily having a, to be physically present. So in a lot of ways, of course, uh, when the program ended, we had already established that link where we could uh, talk to each other, I mean, bounce ideas of each other and all of that. So. And the main core principles of the partnership had been established already. So uh, what we needed was just the fine details and the bouncing of ideas every now and then. And that we could still do very effectively, I mean, with or without a COVID. So I would say that it didn't affect the partnership at all, in my perspective. And I think uh, the rest would speak to the same. I would agree. I think we'd already started to move to the Kualebu uh, unit being more autonomous away from 
Wessex um, and move to a more virtual relationship. And that had coincided with a pause in our funding as well. Um, so in some ways, COVID didn't affect us as much as it might have done because we didn't have any visits planned over the last couple of years. Um, it has given us the opportunity to focus in more on how we can provide virtual support with um, things like virtual workshops and putting together virtual teaching resources. And it's also given us the opportunity to start exploring opportunities for creating a new um, link, a sort of three way link with a team in Gambia, um, which we're hoping is going to grow into a similar successful partnership supported by both us in the UK and the Ghanaian team to help the Gambian team to develop stroke services in their country. Um, so it's given us a bit of an opportunity in a way to um, explore new avenues. And of course, like everybody, we're now hoping that COVID is going to subside and we are going to start being able to get back to doing some face-to-face -face work again. Um, there are a couple of questions here about uh, is there an intensive ward for stroke patients um, and at Corlebu there is the stroke unit um, which takes um, some of the stroke patients doesn't it? Um, Kojo how many beds do you have at the moment on your stroke unit? Hello, Lucy, is there how many? How many beds do you have for stroke patients oh, at the moment? Okay. So currently uh, in total, we have uh, five beds for females and then 10 beds for males. But we also have an extra three beds that can be used for both males and females, depending on the capacity or the load at the time, yes. Yeah, yes, so. but not, ex not all patients manage to get to the stroke unit for various logistical reasons, do they? Yes, yes. So, in fact, that's one of the biggest challenges now because, you know, with success comes the other challenges because of the way the unit operates and because of what has gone out. Everybody, when they have a stroke, that is where they want to be. And so we, we get a lot of traffic coming in. So, uh, in as much as uh, we enjoy that privilege, we still want to, as you did for us, also want to extend that. That's why we try to do that nationwide tour of uh, talking and teaching about, you know, MDT stroke management to help these bigger hospitals, regional hospitals set up uh, their centers. But uh, especially in our part of the world, you need, that's the other part in the leadership. We need to get into the policy side where we can actually influence policy that, you know, sort of, uh, uh, oversees the development of the health system. Yes, so uh, yes, we have challenges with, with admission. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I think it's probably time for a couple more questions and then we may have to wrap up. There was a question um, about how the partnership is funded. Louise, would you be able to answer that? I can, yeah, I'm just typing answers. <laughs> because <laughs> I knew we wouldn't get to them all but um, the partnership has predominantly been funded through a UK-based charity called FET which is the Tropical Health Education um, Trust so lots of really good information on their, their website if you want to have a look at that I'll pop it in the chat um, but they have a range of different programs to support exactly this health partnerships um, like this and we were fortunate enough to gain a small grant initially at the beginning which helped us to get the work off the ground and, and build the case. And then we had two subsequent slightly bigger grants from that. Um, and I would just also say that working with that really helped us to shape the direction of the partnership as well. So they didn't just provide a grant, they actually provide quite a lot of um, structure and support to how the partnership has developed. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and probably the last question, there's, there's quite a few questions in the thread around um, how did the partnership sort of get off the ground and, and you, uh, I can see comments from Sierra Leone and Rwanda about if the partnerships are, if teams are keen to establish a partnership, how would they go about doing that? Um, Albert, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, I was reading some of the other questions in the chat room as well. Um, so um, there are a lot of rather political will, should I like, want to talk about that? Yes, and just how how do how would a team go about trying to establish a partnership? Because 
Okay. In our case, it was a, a yeah. personal relationship. A personal relationship, yeah. yes. So we started a personal relationship. So first of all, you need to get a partner and a willing partner. And um, Dr. Claire Spice, um, she was she worked in Ghana on on um, on an um, ambassadorial road. Went back to the UK and we used to meet at meetings how we could reduce the stroke mortality and mobility. So this grant came up. We applied, and I must say that Ted funded us three times, which is very unusual for Ted. And I must say that Ted also mentioned that we had a lot of value for money. So what they put in, we even gave them more than that. So that is where the um, understanding of a good partnership is that the partners understand each other. There's transparency, there's understanding, and there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's goodwill between each other. So we didn't have um, many fights, maybe where to go to for a holiday after. That's the only thing I remember I was fighting about. But I, I think that, 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 that was a very big part of the partnership. There's a lot of transparency. And I must say, our UK staff were very humble. And I'm sorry for putting you at the Dean's guest house where there are a lot of mosquitoes and um, where they could have slept at a five star hotel. Well, that's what some of the partnerships do. But no, this team did not do that. So that was the humility that we saw in them. And we had to reciprocate that to make it work. So somebody said, political world, if your institution does not want a stroke unit, you will not get a stroke unit done. So I remember we had a lot of issues, a lot of bottlenecks, but we have a way of arm twisting. Um, to, to make it on a light note, the CEO of the hospital had then had two of his relatives who had a stroke and we're not getting a, a unit then. They wanted to give it to psychiatry and I think some other units. So I reminded him that he has a family history of stroke. So if he had one, which is very likely, where is he going to, 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 to go? So I should go ahead and take it. Yeah, using influence where you can and making building relationships with people in the hospital and in the local region who have influence. That's really important. Um, I have to say, um, we've always been made to feel extremely welcome and comfortable when we've visited Ghana, and um, it really has been a pleasure being part of the part of the partnership. So um, just to wrap up, uh, there have been lots and lots of questions that we haven't managed to answer, both in the chat and in the Q&A section. So um, there are, um, these are our contact details, um, Albert's email address, my email address, and Claire Spice, who's our UK lead, who unfortunately wasn't able to join the call today due to a prior commitment. Um, but please do email any of us. And if we can't answer the question ourselves, we will forward your question to a member of our partnership who can. Um, I strongly encourage you to visit our website, which is www.wgstroke.org. Um, lots of the resources that we've mentioned today are on there. There's a blog, um, there's a timeline, there's lots more information about all of our individual members. Um, and again, there's ways to contact us through the website. And we also have a Twitter account um, at wgstroke that you can keep in touch with us that way. Um, it's been a real pleasure and an honour for the partnership to um, present today and we hope that it's been helpful and useful um, to everybody who's been able to tune in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Uh, thank you everyone thank for you. joining. Wonderful discussions, uh, very inspiring presentations and questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for your warm participation in today's webinar. And as I mentioned, the recorded version of this webinar will be shared with you and uploaded also on the World Shook Academy so you can watch it again. In the meanwhile, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for upcoming educational activities like this one. Uh, thank you and take care, everyone. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Are we meeting after? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Hello, welcome.